story, you know. Dennis Robin read his book, Bad As I Want to Be Cool. But to have him here in your community, in your library, you get to feel his story. You get to feel where they came from. It lets you know that no matter what you've gone through, there's still hope to move on. And when you're inspired by what you witness in this room, you're going to go check out a book, right? <laughs> or you're going to go sign up for a library card. You're going to want to support this library. Because not only are they teaching through the materials, through the books, we are teaching through experience, experiential learning, all right? So this is why we do what we do, okay? So make sure you support us. Make sure you stay tapped in with us. Um, call us. Let us know how you could be a part of the library community and keep this thing going, all right? I think we're almost ready. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Excuse me? I am. I am. Absolutely. Um, some of the most life-changing moments came through books. The Game of Life, I just graduated from college, and it's a book called The Game of Life by Florence Gobble Shen. I was taking life very seriously, just wanting to make my impact on the world. And it was like, hey, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Take your time, get to know yourself, you know, observe, listen, don't judge a book by its cover, and it just changed my whole perspective, and I've been kind of floating along, learning, enjoying. Of course, we have our bumps, but material in books and the, the wisdom in the books help me to process things better. They always say it's not what happens to you, it's how you respond. So the information and the wisdom from books allow me to do that. Yes? <laughs> oh, that'll help, right? <laughs> that'll be a good thing. My name is Carl Shaw. I'm the manager of community engagement and programs here at the Wilmington Public Library. Thank you. And myself and the director, I, 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 I would be remiss not to, look, he's trying to hide behind, <laughs> he's trying to hide behind the bar, uh, Mr. J Jamal Rami. Come on out, Jamal. So, so a, a couple of years ago, um, like a lot of you guys, you know, never really heard of the Wilmington Public Library, never been in this building before. But a couple of years ago, um, Jamal started as the director here. And he came to me, I was working in the workforce development department, and he said, you know, um, I got a few ideas, I kind of want to bounce off you, and I heard that you are the guy who could help me make this happen. And ever since then, it's been history after history. Last year, we won the highest national award for libraries and museums, the IMLS Medal Award. We were the keynote speakers for the uh, Newcastle County Entrepreneurship, uh, Entrepreneurship Summit. So it's just been accolade. We were even voted one of the most beautiful buildings in the, in the nation, the most beautiful libraries in the nation. You know, so, and the thing about it is we're just having a good time. We're just having a good time. We're here to bring this experience to you guys. So we're just having a good time. Thanks for your question, bro. Thanks for that. Cool. All right. For the moment you've all been waiting for. I mean, this brother, I could tell a little bit about how I felt. You know, I saw him first on the movie Wild Style, you know. Um, and I mean, like, how this art form is, like, worldwide now. Trillions and trillions of dollars, you know, uh, generated from this culture. Started in little old Bronx, New York. Yeah. This gentleman is an intricate part of this. And like I said, I already shared with you some of his amazing, uh, amazing, like it was Grandmaster Flash in the Furious Five, even though it was Melly Mel rapping, that's right. Grandmaster Flash put that together. So he wanted me to also let you know some other bullet points here, one second. So we all know this, point number one, he is one of the inventors of hip hop music. Number two, he is the first hip-hop artist to be inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He is also one of the first hip-hop artists to win a Grammy Award. He is the first, a lot of firsts here, the first DJ to turn a turntable into an instrument. Sorry, 
and most recently, he received a doctorate, y'all, a doctorate from Buffalo State University. So he is now called Dr. Joseph Sadler. Dr. Joseph Sadler. But we all know him as Grand Master Flash. Give him a warm applause, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, I come from a time where there was no computers. No social media. No apps, no technology. I come from a time when it was nothing. South Bronx. 2730 Dewey Avenue, Throsneck Projects, Apartment 2C. In the Sadler home, there were rules. The rules was this. No one was allowed in the living room where the brown box lived. No one 
was allowed to go in dad's closets where the, the music lived. So dad would come home from a hard day's work. He was an iron worker for the New York City subway system. He would come home, come in the crib, go to the kitchen. Mom would make him dinner. He would then go get his spirits, go over to this closet, and pull out these square things that had a picture of like a horse or a cow or son or a child or a train. I was wondering what was he gonna do with this square thing? And he would pull out this black disc and he would take this black disc over to the brown box. And I wasn't allowed in the living room unless I was accompanied by an adult. So I used to walk with him and follow him do this. And he would put this black disc on this stick, press a button, this thing would go up, the record would go down, and the thing would go down, and sound used to come out of the brown box. I thought dad was a magician. How did he do that? I said to myself, this is very interesting. So I used to watch dad do this, come in from a hard day's work. Mom would cook him dinner. He'd get his spirits. He'd go over to that closet and pull out one of them square things and pull out the round, round black disc and go over to the brown box and sound would come out. I made it a point to watch him every time he came home. After watching him for a period of time, ladies and gentlemen, I said to myself, hmm, what? What if I, what if I, so now the plan changed. I had to watch him go to work. Dad was a track worker and he had this pouch of tools and when he would throw it over his shoulders, clink, and the door would open, then slam, bang. I would wait for a period of time. And I would go into the kitchen and I would grab a chair, climb up on the chair, turn the knob, and the first time I opened up that closet and I looked in there, I was like, what is this? And Mind you, I had been watching Dad for a period of time. So I grabbed the one that was my height. And I walked into the living room where I wasn't supposed to be. And I went over to the brown box and I pulled out the black disc. And I did exactly what he did. So in my household, the sad the household, if it was hours between 10 and 4, the stereo should not be on. So whoever's home with me, see, here's the stereo. And they run in the stereo and they say, if dad catch you, he is going to reprimand you, like really seriously reprimand you. Oh, okay. So I take the black disc, put it back into the square thing, and I go to put it back in the closet. And I close it. I'm thinking I get away with it. But this is one thing about dad's music. He was very meticulous where he placed things. So he'd come home, the dinner thing, he'd grab his spirits, he'd go into the closet, and <sighs> Violet, Cometa, Penny, Lily, Joe, everybody come out. And from the oldest to the youngest, who was in the closet with my records? 
And by the time he got to me, my hiney was on fire so many times. I would be sent to bed early. I would get up early. I would hear the clink of his tools. I would hear the door slam. I would wait. I would go in the kitchen and get a chair. And I would bring it over to the closet. I mean, after a while, he just, like my, my hiney was on fire weekly. Like he was just tearing me out of the frame. And this is the thing that was probably the most hurtful about it is my father was the older brother to the 1957 heavyweight champ of the world, Sandy Sadler. So his hands was like bricks going across my hiney. Time got time passed. Dad left, left mom to fight for us. It's pretty rough. The welfare check, the first and the sixteenth. It was a pretty, pretty rough time. But at this time, I'm older, and I'm watching mom now. Mom is a seamstress. She's making our clothes. I'm still perplexed on where the music is coming from because when a brown box is not on, you hear nothing. But when a, bl when a black disc is on the brown box, you hear music. So when my mom wasn't looking, I opened up her needle case and I went over to the stereo and I turned it on, but this time not pressing the button to get the thing to move up, I just pressed it enough to turn the platter on in a clockwise position. And I took the needle and I placed it on the black tunnels and I felt vibrations coming through the needle and I said, oh wow, the music lives inside the black tunnels. From this point on, there was a serious marriage between me and vinyl. As I got older, I started to just look at electrical things in the house. How is it that my bigger sisters could turn on something and it'll do something? So after a while, I was unscrewing the back of everything in the house from the, my sister's hair dryer to the stereo in the house to the washing machine to everything. I became public and me number one in the house and mom said you have to stop doing this. I'm going to send you, to, I'm going to send you somewhere where you can learn what you are doing. And she sent me to Samuel Gompers Vocational and Technical High School in the Bronx, 149th Street and Southern Boulevard. From that point on, I got to learn about Westinghouse, Edison, Tesla, Banneker, Von Braun. Now when I'm unscrewing the back of something, I understand what it is. There's resistors, capacitors, transformers. There's two types of voltages, DC, AC. AM, FM is amp amplitude mo modulation and frequency modulation. I'm starting to understand what Ohm's law is in the theory. The last project that we made at Samuel Gompers was to build an amplifier. I built a little cheap amplifier, but I understood solid state versus vacuum tubes. I was able to break down the resistor color code. What was the capacitor? What was the diode? How do the push-pull circuits, how does it go from DC to AC? Once I figured that out, I went back to vinyl. Fell in love with the turntable, fell in love with the vinyl. 
But ladies and gentlemen, for some reason, songs made me very, very angry. And I'll explain. I wasn't really happy with the way songs was made. So, I started listening to the radio as a youngster. And it was these mix shows that would come on with DJs that blended. But the thing about it was, I couldn't tell where the song started and ended to the next song. I found that to be very intriguing. And then I was asked to go see a street DJ. And when I seen this particular gentleman, for the life of me, I was wondering, why is one song crashing into this other, this one crashes into this other, and why does that sound like that? It made me very, very angry. I said, maybe it was just a bad night. I'll come see him another time. I went and listened to the disco DJ again, flawless, from one song to the other. The transition, incredible. And I went back and I seen these DJs take this incredible music and just crash one into the other. So if you're dancing, right, you got to stop. You almost fall. I'm like, and I called it disarray unison. You can see the heads doing this when the song is playing. But when you switch the song, you can see the heads going all over the place. That made me quite angry. That's when I started studying songs from a mathematical point of view. And this is what I did. Four bars forward is six counterclockwise revolutions full loop. Let me explain, guys and girls. If I were to listen to a song sonically, if I listen to a song sonically, meaning how the way it sounds, when I put the headphones on, I'd hear it a certain way. If I pass the headphones to you, you hear it a certain way. If I pass the headphones to you, you'll hear it a certain way. So I said I cannot listen to music in that manner. I used math. And the best part of the record for me was the drum solo part. And this is the part that made me most angry. It's a song going to be playing, and then it'll be the, and then back to the whack part. I'm like, no. Why is this? Why are your songs being made like this? So, my best friend Easy Mike used to come to my house and knock on the door. Miss Sadler, can Joe come outside and play? Ah, ladies and gentlemen, I was trying to come outside and play for three years, but I was just too busy being angry on why music is made the way that it was being made. Four bars forward, six counterclockwise revolutions equals full loop. The house of hip hop in its order. Graffiti, DJ, breaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not claim to have created hip hop. I didn't create the word. I created the tools that makes hip hop possible. Let me explain. My contribution is a unification of these two elements. The quick mix theory lives on this. It was in service of the breaker and the rapper. I had to figure out a way 
to make it continuous without you having to do any readjustment with your feet or your hiney. I had to figure this out. So if I was going from a, right, a, a white drummer to a black drummer to a foreign drummer to an American drummer to a pop drummer, rock, jazz, blues, funk, disco, R&B, one behind another, I had to figure out a way to make all these sounds hold hands which had nothing to do with sonics, math. Because the sound of a drummer on an Italian break will be different from a, the drum break on an American break. So I'm not listening for the bass and all that there. I'm listening for the four bars that I need to go in a forward motion. So I came up with this thing called the quick mix theory. A lot of the songs that I played back then a lot of the great bake breaks, they were white bands, but these were some bad mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm gonna do here in the digital age, I'm gonna play a few samples from songs, because what you got to understand is most people say words and music when you're writing a song, and hip hop is music and words because the rapper cannot rap to nothing. I mean, some could. I like Jay Z rapping a cappella, he's dope, you know, but not everybody can do that. So, for me, I'm going to demonstrate just some songs that became staples for hip hop. One, one, one. Every music connoisseur, every lover of vinyl, and DJs at that time were extremely angry at me because I was putting my fingers all over the record. Like, they used to treat records like children with the velvet brush, and they would wipe it very carefully and slip it inside the white paper, then put it into the jacket. Me, I took two, I take two copies and just shove that motherfucker inside there onto the next beat. Everybody in the world was mad at me. Who the hell am I to put crayons on the record? That was blasphemy. How dare you do that? But I tried doing it by picking the arm up and putting it back down. And this is the way it works. A male star, you can identify. If you, pick the, if you pick the vine up and drop it back down, the chances of you being in the exact same place is slim to almost nothing. You probably won't be there. So I had to come up with this theory. Hold on, that's the whack part right there. We never. That's the key thing. If you're going to do this thing, never get to the whack part. <laughs> Women would throw a drink in your face. Don't get to the whack part. And I got to tell you, the name of the song is called Sweet Green Fields from Seals and Croft. What the hell? When we went record shopping, I had to be very mindful. Do not pay attention to the title because it could be tricky. There could be a beat on that.
game up to no, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. Just Blaze did something to this. Tell me if you know this song. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to explain to you the early, early, early science of hip-hop. I'm going to say this again. I didn't invent the word. I didn't say I invented the hip-hop. I'm saying that I came up with the tools that allows hip-hop to be here. The elongating of the bed of a particular area so that the rapper could speak is my contribution to the culture. The elongating of a section of music was made so the rapper can have a beat to speak on. I say this in a godly fashion, what if I didn't do this? What would the rapper have to speak on? No studios, no computers. Just this. So what I'm gonna do here is, let me grab that thing. Got it? So you're seeing the digital side of things. But what I really want to do is I want to break down the quick mix theory to you. So, fame, lose the laptop, let's go vinyl. And I say this, there are very few people that I love that do this thing in a mean, 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 mean way. How you doing, Mel Star? <laughs> See, this thing, this DJing and quick mix theory way of DJing is like driving. 
You have to know where you're going. You have to know when to pump the brakes. Otherwise, you will sound like that guy that was back in the days doing what I call train wrecks, one beat smashing into the other, and you have to find yourself around. It's very annoying. I've been told by some guys that they found their wives at my party. So if I can keep the beat going and she don't leave, leave the floor to go to the bar for a drink, I can get the phone number, get the digits, get the nine yards, and everything is all good. So now I'm going to give you a, a basic formula of how I came up with this. I'm going to explain this again, guys. I'm going to explain this again. Four bars forward, meaning let's just take good times because I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying when I say four bars forward. So let's take good times. Good times. One, two, three, four bars. The average song that's listened to by the brain, four bars is recognized, statistically, statistically speaking. So what I did was, I came up with this quick mix theory as the standard to keeping the beat on time. I'm going to let the thing play four bars. And then I'm going to spin it backwards six times. And I'm going to re-arrive at the top of the break. So let's take this song right here. Four bars, four bars, forward, throw it, six. We can rise to the top. 
One, two, and I tell you, this was a very lonely time for me to have to figure this whole thing out. Mike stopped knocking on the door, asking him, am I going to come outside to play, go to basketball, chill with the chicks, nine yards, this, that, that, that. I never made it out. But on that third year, Easy Mike spent the night at my house, and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I kicked him, and I said, get out of the bed. I need to show you something. And Easy Mike said to me, so is this the reason why you wasn't coming outside to play? I said, yes, this is what it was. I didn't want to be angry anymore. I didn't want to listen to train wreck DJs anymore. And I wanted to be able to do what I call, matter of fact, I'm going to use an analogy. In grade school, when we were going on a trip, we would get to the corner. Before we cross the street, there'd be a teacher in the front, and there'd be a teacher in the back. And one of the teachers would say, everybody hold hands, whoever you're with, and we will all cross the street together. My analogy was this. If it was a white drummer, a black drummer, a pop drummer, rock, jazz, blues, funk, if I can make all these beats hold hands and make this one song, somebody might like this. Now, there's an exception to the rule when the beat is two bars. So when the beat is two bars, when the beat is two bars, that means my intersector has to be brought back three times so that I can re-arrive at the top of the break. Now, when I got this record, this probably was the most strangest album covers that I ever had. But I had to say to myself, like, Flash, don't, don't. Remember, you could be tricked. This could be something, really something here, really good. And the album was by this new group. And it was, the album was called Toys in the Attic. Like, who the hell puts their toys in the attic? And for what reason? 
and it sounded like this. Um, mom's not here, dad's not here, but I, I kind of owe this all to them because dad wasn't tearing me out the frame for touching it. He taught me the value of it. He like, kept tearing me out the frame. And mom was the same shit. She taught me the importance of the needle. So when I came on the scene doing this, every DJ that was playing the way they was playing, they had to not play that way anymore. I didn't mean to hurt any feelings. I didn't mean to disrespect anybody. You know, my sound system was absolutely disgusting. Um, with the help of my training from Sam Ugopis, I had two little cheap loose speakers and I used to play on 927, 927 Fox Street. And it was no bass on the sound system, it was all treble. <laughs> But it was how we, we grew up, and um, with hip hop being 50, I'm saying to myself, you know, a lot of times people they call me, they call me a legend, and I, I got to tell you that scares me. And I let me tell you why, because a lot of times when you're a legend or an inventor or something, you don't get the chance to see what you did come into full fruition. It's I appreciate it when people call me it, but it makes me very, very afraid. And all I can say is this. When I invented this, the world could have said, hell no. Instead, they said, what is this? And then it went from little business in the Bronx to the producers and Record companies coming in saying, what is this thing that I was doing? And then there were machines built, like samplers. So now, when the computer is hooked up to the sampler, what I do manually, now a computer could take a small passage of music and make it continuous. And this is where we get big business. Hip hop goes from the small organic thing in the Bronx to every household on planet Earth. And, you know, when I think about it, it almost scares me because this could have possibly not have happened. There are those who invent things, and the world says, no, we don't like that. 
and it's like I took my life to do this. And I've been doing this for 49 years. And And I, sometimes I just shed a tear and I say, wow. So if I'm in Japan and I, I see the DJ holding it steady, and I go to Australia and I see the DJ holding it steady, and I go to London and I see the DJ holding it steady, and I go around the world and the, all the DJs is holding it steady, and I hear these incredible rap records now, and I'm saying to myself, I hear the sample in it. I I thank God that I'm here and I gotta say this to you guys without y'all there is no me. It just doesn't happen. And I'm thankful to have seen the world over two hundred times. I am thankful that I come from a place in a time where there was nothing. I come from a place where I couldn't afford to buy equipment. So there was a junkyard behind the projects, the project, project, and that's where I got my pieces from. And I had to jury rig and put it together by hand. I figure if you love something, if you truly love something, it should take care of you for the rest of your life. Thank you. My name is Grandmaster Flash. So, come on, Carl. Matter of fact, let's do that. Before I, before I let it go, turn it on. Is it on? I need to just show you guys, when I talk about the tools of hip-hop, I almost forgot to do this, but I, like, when you first buy a turntable, right, you get this ugly piece of rubber. Now, you know what I'm talking about. That pancake ugly piece of rubber. And I was trying to, like, I was trying to like spin the record back and it was giving me all this friction. I'm like, oh man. But I remember my mother was a seamstress. I touched polyester, rayon, silk, cotton, suede, leather. The eureka moment came. I ran to the material store. And I had to figure out, matter of fact, hey, come here for a second. Bring a vinyl. I had to figure out how can I, cut that off for you, babe. How can I get a piece of material that will allow the platter to comfort comfortably go clockwise while I went counterclockwise? Remember, mom was a seamstress. This is where she comes into the mix. So, I'm walking down the aisles of the material store and I'm touching rayon, silk, polyester, cotton, suede, leather, felt. Felt. Why do I remember felt? And this is how I remember felt. In grade school, we were asked to do an assignment to cut out alphabet letters, and those who cut out the alphabet letters the best, you would get five stars. So I bring the whole thing, Mom, I got, I got five stars, the whole thing, and I would get chocolate chip 
cookies. But let me bring the two together. So, is iron on yet? Is it on? Make sure it's hot. So, what I did was felt. But here's the problem with felt, guys and girls. It's limp. So that meant I would get forward motion resistance from the platter. Fan, bring the scissors so we can make a hole here real quick. Help me out. It's all good. You guys still with me? Okay. So, you got it? Okay. So, with the hairs raised on this, the platter doesn't comfortably move in the forward motion. Somehow or another, I had to make this flimsy material less flimsy and somehow compress the hairs. And here's what I did. When mom wasn't looking, Dad was no longer home, so I didn't have to look for two people, just one. And I went inside the cabinet, and I got mom's spray starch. And here's what I did. This, the, the felt wasn't as flimsy anymore, but the hairs that was causing the forward motion resistance was no longer a problem. I used to call this a wafer. I called it a wafer, if you guys can remember. During Easter, when I was a little shorty, mom would dress me up with a three-piece suit on. And we would go to church, and the, and the pastor would be in the middle. We'd walk down, and that little white thing we used to get, and put it in our mouth, shit was a wafer. <laughs> and that's what I called this. But the problem with this is it still was forward motion resistance. So... Mom made me chocolate chip cookies when I did good in school. She used wax paper. My final problem was forward motion resistance. I took the wax paper, put it on a steel platter, took that rubber mat, threw it in the garbage, Put this on top of that. No more resistance. Today they call it a slip mat. I called it a wafer. <laughs> Turntables were also an issue with me as a shorty. I remember trying to find a turntable that had the right power to go in a forward motion. I tried Fisher Price, Magnavox, Zenith, early pioneer. And I remember going up to go coming home from school, getting off the bus, and there was this store called Vic Mar Electronics. There was this battleship gray, ugly turntable in the window. And it had these things on it. I thought the turntable had the mumps. That's what I used to call it. So I, I remember I asked the salesman, is it possible, could you please take that turntable out the window so that I could study it? He looks at me. 
I look at him. He says, I'll be right back. He comes back with a linebacker. This dude is dumb big. And they're both looking at me and they're saying, again, what is it you want to do, son? I says, I'm doing a study on turntables. And could you please just take the turntable off a little while, plug it in, because I want to check the torque, the forward movement of the platter. The linebacker went back again and came out with this skinny white guy. His name was Victor. And I says to Victor, I'm just trying to do a study with turntables. Could you please just take it out of the window for a little while, and I just want to just check the forward movement. He looked at me. He said, oh, take it out for him. So they put it on the counter, plugged it in, and I looked down at the label to see what model it was, and it was this unknown company called Techniques. The model was the SL23, belt drive. This elongated bed of music for the rapper to speak on was created by the SL23, which is the great, 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 great grandfather of any of these turntables right here. So when I say to you I don't use sonics, it's strictly math, man. Math. When you rub the way that you do, it's called head count. You're counting. You're counting in between the bars, Mel. That's what you're doing. You know, because if she's dancing and she got to, like, do that and you miss the beat, she's throwing a drink in your face. Come on. Now, we're never allowing that. So I was supposed to say that before I say goodnight, but I just want to say, like, hip-hop is about to be 50. I thank God that I make it there. And if anybody has any questions for me, please feel free, call. No, I got you. We got time for about three or four questions, all right? So one, two, three. We can just roll. Let's roll. This is, it's okay. Right. And my cousin Demetrius, what's going on, baby? You all right? You good? <laughs> thank you for allowing me to come down to your town, baby. It's all good. Got family in the building. Okay, so... Uh, I got a couple questions for you. Um, sure. So when we younger, because we around the same age, for, so when it comes out, my question, one of the questions is, your techniques, right? Like, like in six seventy nine and everything, everything you just no seventy two. Seventy two. Okay. So did you did you expose that to the other DJs? You know what I mean? They followed me. They followed you, right? Because we used to do block parties. So right. when I was doing this thing on the turntables, they wanted to know every piece of equipment that I was using. So the standard at that time was the SL23 and the Gemini DACX 2000 Silverface mixer. Yeah, we followed you too. <laughs> yeah, we followed you too. Okay. Yeah, really. We, yeah, because it took us a long time to figure that out, you know. It took us a long time to figure out what could we use. Right. And that's why I was wondering, you know. Yeah, I stayed in the crib, man, for a really long time trying to just figure the whole damn thing out, man. You know, in a... Actually, I, I, I'm trying to find a Gemini mixer, and one of them is, like, worth a million dollars now. Right. You know, so a lot of these tools that I use, guys, come from nothing. I'm a child of the projects, was on welfare. You know, I come from foster care. And I just want to just say this before I answer the next question. Ain't nothing impossible. Right. I'm standing here. You may, you may have the next thing. Don't give up. What's the next question? How did you and uh, the Furious Five hook up? Because it looked, you know, when we, when we growing up, you're going man, too far ahead. Number one. They five years later. Oh, they five uh, years Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm by myself for years. Yeah. My young brother, how do you do? Oh, you got a hell of a voice, man. Oh, yes. <laughs> how are you, man? This was established 1964, long before you did. Because mama had two boyfriends, one Caucasian, one black, and they bought her the same exact turntables, a Magnavox, oh. with the detached speakers. Hmm. Yes. And how I learned 
was my brothers would come bum rushing in the house from playing ball and they step on the records and scratch it up. So step I, on the records. Yeah. That's yeah, big. Well, you know why that I'm sit was. Sit down for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Huh. <Yeah. laughs> Because I take the record out of the jacket and what have you, and I put it on, and instead of putting it back in the jacket for the next record, I just drop it on the floor. And they'd walk in the house and step on it. So I say, well, don't worry about it. I'll get a new one. But that scratched up record, I'd put that on first, and then I'd put on the one behind it. I had what you call wafer long before they called it a wafer. And it still worked. This guy but had a lot way before me. Yes. Shit. I was, uh, I was only been? 13 years old with Columbia Record Club. You buy 12 and get the 13th one. For you sound like a singer, man. You want to sing a song for us, man? <laughs> you sound like a singer. Well, I, I'm saying, yes. what I'm saying is, because of all that and fast forward, I thank you for what you're doing because you just taught me my black ass something with the four bars going forward and the six back, you just taught me something. And I have to give it to you. Thank you. Flash, respect, respect. Where you from? Where you, what you do? Pop, grouchy Greg. Okay, you know, you there know. it is. What's up, man? Question. Um, one thing you left out was, uh, how old were you when you know you came up with this theory in your bedroom and you, you were saying that between thirteen and fifteen because it took 13. me three years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Flash? How are you, man? Hey, I was in Oakland and they got a hip hop museum out there, and they actually had a piece of something you created called the Grandmaster Flash Transformer. Flashformer. For, yep. When yeah. did you create that? Okay, because this is where Samuel Gompers comes in. Um, I put inside of it two intermittent switches that work in reverse. When you press them down, they close the circuit. When you hold, when you push it, when you let them go up, because they're spring loaded, it opens the circuit. So you can. And, 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 and transform because some people didn't know how to do it with the fader because you have to have a certain type of dexterity to be able to take apart and make it and, 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 and make it musical. So it was it was actually a toy, but it took off. I mean, it was, it was all good. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, it's getting ready to be 50 years old. Yeah. I'm curious what your favorite parts of hip hop. Are that have come since you? Favorite parts. That I'm still here. I think that's probably it because it goes back to what I stated a little while ago. You know, we inventors, we inventors, sometimes we don't get a chance to see, you know, what we did in full fruition. You know, so I'm just watching this. I watched it start, and I'm, I'm, now I'm watching it have a 50th birthday. You know, that's, like, God is just wonderful all day long. You know, I'm, I'm here to see this. You know, I, I'm here in Delaware, and I'm talking to people that don't find this boring. This is wonderful. You know, <laughs> you know because <laughs> I can remember growing up, I didn't know the hip sayings. I was a geek, embarrassed. I was like trying to be cool. Easy Mike was just slippery and cool and fly. He was too fly for me. I wasn't going to go out there. You know, I grew up very shy and I kind of stayed in my room. You know, me and my, my dopamine pincher, Caesar. That was my audience. Next question. Uh, I wanted to know was it hard to get a lot of the samples cleared that you used uh, in the early 80s? Okay, so let me tell you about that, which is, I'm, I'm going to answer this question but you're going too far ahead. So now, when I learned how to take a composition and take a portion out of the record, it was called a sample, right? But at that particular time, when it was being inserted into hip hop records, there were no laws applied yet. They couldn't quantify 
what do we charge this person for using part of their composition to make this composition? So early on, it wasn't until the lawyers figured out, okay, um, and I remember being part of um, Rush Communications, one of the uh, producers, you had to clear James Brown's, huh? And if you didn't, you, they doing you in. So early on, there was no laws. Now there's more laws than ever. But the thing about it with hip hop from a musical point of view, sir, is like we took songs that were in the freezer that probably were never gonna be hits. <laughs> we made them hits and we still do that today. Next question. Man, I just want to say thanks, man. When you were talking about the slip mats in the, in, the, in, the, in the plastic, man, I used to take that plastic, cut it out of there when I had the Geminis, <laughs> the belt dry Geminis that would skip constantly, you know, <laughs> cut out that plastic out of there. Old times, and man. And I got the Mortifying nightclub needles with the Technique 1200. Ooh, and it okay. was on after that. Okay. You know what I mean? And you That's how you can see your glory. I mm -hmm. uh, thank you, man. All good. <laughs> thank you. Any more questions? So glad to have you. Thank You've you. been imitated. Do you find that that's, um, well, do you get credit for that? And do you find that that's flattering or are you, I don't want oh, to say Oh, very flattering because that would have been no fun. Me doing this by myself, that would have been, like, I can remember trying to teach people this early on. Good question. And when I would come out in the parks and do it, DJs thought it was some kind of magic trick. So... At that point, I hooked up with a DJ partner who had equipment, and we put our equipment together. So when I finished creating this technique, I tried to teach him this. His hands was three times the size of mine, so I'm like, you gotta be gentle with it, bring it back, you know, this and that. But in the living room, there was this little kid who was able to pick up the needle and drop it right on the beat over and over again. Needle drops, incredible. I said, yo, Gene, who's that? He said, oh, that's my little brother. I'm like, yo, can I? You mind if I, I teach him? And Gene was the bully of the block. And he said to me, if I catch my little brother on the set, you're gonna get reprimanded, like really <laughs> reprimanded. I'm like, come on, Gene, look, he's his hand. He had hands of steel. Gene would go see his girlfriend. I would, I would take a milk crate, I bring it in the bedroom, I tell him to stand up, and I would do something, and he would emulate me. I'm like, yo, please don't tell your brother. He's going to kill me. He's like, okay. So six months went by. This was in the winter time. Summer came. We're doing a block party, 63 Park on 168th Street in Boston Road. I'm like, yo, I got the milk crate. I'm gonna get off, you get on. If the world wasn't gonna learn it through me, they was gonna be embarrassed watching him because they, they know he would have to change their game and his name was Grand Wizard Theodore, my first student. That's how it went down. Any more questions? Anybody? Don't be shy. I just want to say thank you for everything you did staying you. in your room. And my first question is, because you were mixing so many different genres of music, which I really appreciate, who did you go to to like, you know, come in contact with that kind of music? Because in the projects, I, I know for me, Ooh. before headphones, it was like you had to listen to a real quiet because people would clown you in a second. And my household, in the Sadler household, dad was listening to Glenn Miller, mom was listening to Lena Horn, Violet was listening to disco, dad, uh, Kometa was listening to uh, funk, Penny was listening to Latin. Like I was very, very fortunate, depending on who was on the stereo that day, that I learned that music should not be in 
categories and it shouldn't be on charts. I don't understand why they do that. And that's why I was turned off with the sonics of music and I went to math. And I says, he has 25 drum beats back to back. DJs, take your choice. Follow me. Make it your own. Like dudes like him, Nell Star. <laughs> Incredible DJ. Yes, so my family was pretty much. Anybody? Yes. Hey, okay, congratulations on your uh, doctorate that you got. Your, do you. your doctor now. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rightfully so. Rightfully so. Um, do you, Do you still perform like old school sets and everything like that? Before COVID, I was traveling to 150 countries for the past 18 years. I was never, never home. It was great. The bad part about that was I would come home and, and one of my cousins would be pregnant. And then I, next time I seen him, I was looking up on him like that. Like I, I missed a lot. I really missed a lot of my siblings with their children in the whole nine yards. But it was quite an experience. Like, you know, like going to Vietnam and getting the other story. Scary. Good. Good. Going to Germany and getting the other story. Scary. So I, I learned a lot. Anybody? Cross the room, man. This is good. All right, two more, two more. How you doing, Flash? How are you, man? Hey, first and foremost, thanks for blessing us here. Thank you. Really, glad to really, be here, thanks man. for blessing Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm a, I'm a very old school DJ myself, and your story is pretty much like mine. Couldn't afford anything. No. But I, I tell you what, I'm kind of disappointed you didn't really give the 1200s any play today. You didn't, uh, you didn't mention that the 1200s changed the game, I think. Of course, they didn't. The SL23s did. If the, if the uh, SL23s weren't born, that 1200 would have never been born. We got to start from the beginning. Yeah. I just wanna, yeah. I just want to offer you an invitation to come back to see our kids at school. Ooh. Because I don't know music, but I know math. Ooh. And I have a question for you. And again, I don't know music. Is there six bars? And if no. there's six bars. No, it's not six bars. No. It's four bars. It's four bars forward. Let me let me answer a question. It's four bars forward and it's six counterclockwise. So my, my sticking point, I'm, and I'm gonna try to explain it to you. If I hear four bars of music forward, I was hoping to spin the record back four bars and get to the to the back to the beginning of the break. But every time I checked, I was in the wrong place. I'm like, why am I in the wrong place? And if you know about math, the third plays a major role in the additional two turns. Two thirds. Right. Okay. To the thirds, baby. Two, you went to the third. I went, but I went back two more bars. Right. Two more spins, two more bars, two more spins, yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. So let me just say this. I mean, as far as mathematics, he mentioned mathematics, science. I don't think you guys understand, well, hopefully you do, what we're witnessing here. You're taking someone who just had an instinct, curiosity, and inspiration to bring magic through what he saw in his, as he admit, meager surroundings and made magic. And when other people saw this magic, corporations just usurped the ingenuity of this brother and made corporation after corporation, marketing after marketing, billions, trillions of dollars generated from this brother's mind right here. So, so it's extremely important that we look at this brother, like Nori says on Drink Champs, give him his adoration, flowers, respect, his honors right now. 
ladies and gentlemen, Grand Master Flash. And unfortunately, we're still in the era of COVID, so we're going to ask that you guys slowly leave the building <laughs> and, and, and give the brother his space, all right? I appreciate you guys for coming out, all right? See you guys in the fall. I'll see you guys in the spring when we come back for Black History Month in, in, the, in February. Thank you. <laughs>